The WCW and ECW invasion of the WWF should have been, in my opinion, the greatest storyline in the history of American professional wrestling. When Vince McMahon was able to purchase his competition and gain ownership of a company that tried to put him out of business for years upon years, there was a real opportunity here to tell a story that had never been told before. Along with this story, the dream match possibilities were seemingly endless. Fans had always compared the top WCW guys to the top WWF guys. Who would win between Sting and The Undertaker? What would happen if Stone Cold Steve Austin faced? Bill Goldberg. For fans who lived through the Monday Night War, the prospect of WCW vs WWF really happening on TV was the ultimate storyline. And yes, WCW may not have been the company it once was when Vince McMahon made the purchase in 2001, but in the hands of the World Wrestling Federation and the money that the company could put into the angle, there was always a chance that the storyline could have worked. But in the end, unfortunately, it wasn't what we expected it to be. Now, I'm not saying the Invasion storyline wasn't entertaining, and I'm not saying it was a total flop. It definitely wasn't when talking about the financial side of things, but it sure wasn't what many people thought it would be. Fans in general wanted to see the main event WCW stars who brought the fight during the Monday Night War. Fans wanted guys like Flair, Sting, The Outsiders, Hogan, and even Bill Goldberg at the time. We did get a bunch of talented WCW guys during the Invasion, and even some of the old originals such as Booker T and Diamond Dallas Page, but the invasion also included lots of WCW's younger talent, many of which were unestablished or had rose to prominence when WCW didn't have a huge audience watching at home. Had Vince waited it out until some guy's Time Warner contracts had expired, then we could have had a very different WCW invasion, but there was a lack of patience here. The angle went ahead when a huge majority of WCW's true originals were not available, and what's worse, many of these main event WCW stars would still eventually sign with the WWF well after the invasion story had ended. But anyway, we'll talk about that a little later. This this will be a two part video looking at the invasion storyline. This upload will look at the beginning of the angle and the invasion pay per view, and part two will look at how the angle ended and where the WWF went after they had destroyed their competition. The story of Vince McMahon purchasing WCW has been told a million times. I've even talked about it myself in my last ever WCW Nitro video. Check that one out if you want a little backstory. On March 26, 2001, on the WCW Nitro broadcast just before WrestleMania 17, Shane McMahon showed up to announce in storyline that he was the new owner of WCW and his father was not. Vince and Shane were in the middle of a rivalry that would have originally ended at WrestleMania 17, however it appeared that the WCW buyout would get weaved into the Vince vs Shane storyline. Some fans didn't like this, they felt that having the McMahon feud at the forefront of the WCW invasion was the wrong call, and in a way I agree. I liked that a WWF higher up was responsible for bringing WCW to the WWF, that part made sense, but the whole invasion angle was used used as a backdrop for the ongoing McMahon rivalry that had been seemingly going on forever at this point. Still, Shane announced that he was the owner of WCW, and WCW audiences were left wondering what this all meant for the future of World Championship Wrestling. At WrestleMania 17, Shane McMahon defeated Vince McMahon in an entertaining street fight while members of the WCW roster looked on from a skybox. It's been reported that the WCW guys in attendance, including Lance Storm, Sean Stasiak and Stacey Keebler were actually going to help Shane defeat Vince McMahon at WrestleMania 17, but because Sean Stasiak announced to a media outlet that the WCW superstars were going to get involved in the McMahon vs McMahon match, the plans were completely changed and the WCW guys instead watched the entire event from their skybox. Let's get a main gripe out of the way here before continuing on, the absence of some of WCW's key players. 
There were a lot of fans watching WrestleMania 17 who didn't know who any of these WCW guys were, and so questions would arise in regards to superstars like Ric Flair, Scott Steiner, Kevin Nash and others. Well, the majority of WCW's top wrestlers had contracts with AOL Time Warner, WCW's former parent company, and even though Vince McMahon had purchased WCW, these contracts were still in effect with AOL Time Warner. This meant that guys could continue collecting a paycheck while not having to wrestle, a lot of these guys were offered substantially less money to come over to the WWF to begin work immediately, and a notable name who took up this offer was Booker T. He took the risk and gave up a lot of money to begin work straight away with the World Wrestling Federation. Vince McMahon also had the option of taking on the AOL contracts. So for example, and again this is just an example, let's say Bill Goldberg had a year left on his Time Warner deal for around $1 million. Vince McMahon could pay that one million and get the services of Bill Goldberg right away, if Goldberg also agreed. Vince, however, decided to allow AOL Time Warner to continue paying out these contracts, as Vince McMahon rightfully felt that some of these contracts were bad deals, and some of the superstars were not worth the money they were getting paid, and Vince sure didn't want to pay out millions of dollars for superstars who weren't worth it. Keep in mind too that the majority of these superstars were happy enough to sit at home and get paid, they were in no rush to begin bumping around a wrestling ring again, and you can't blame them either. Had Vince overpaid for big WCW talent like Flair, Goldberg and the NWO, there's also a great argument to be made that Vince could have recouped a lot of his financial losses by presenting a WCW invasion storyline that featured bigger WCW superstars, spend money to earn money and all that stuff. But Vince decided he would not take on any AOL Time Warner contracts, but instead he would offer lower contracts to those who wanted to work straight away. Again, Booker T is the notable name who took up Vince's offer. Many of the guys who did jump over to the WWF simply did not have lucrative AOL Time Warner contracts, and a few didn't even have a contract at all. It really makes you wonder why the WWF just didn't wait until the main chunk of contracts had expired. The majority of big name superstars, with the exception of Sting, would end up with the WWF within the next two or three years following the invasion anyway, so Vince's decision here to go ahead with the WCW invasion angle when he didn't have access to World Championship Wrestling's biggest names at the time will always be something that baffles me. Paul Heyman summed it up well when he said, The Invasion storyline could never live up to the hype because the key components weren't there. What was WCW? WCW was Hulk Hogan and the NWO. They weren't coming, they had guaranteed checks to sit at home. WCW was Ric Flair and the Four Horsemen. Flair wasn't coming, he had a guaranteed check to sit at home. WCW was Goldberg. Goldberg wasn't coming, he had a guaranteed check to sit at home. So what did you really get? A watered down version of a bad episode of WCW Thunder against the entire WWF. So nobody was really interested in it and I can't blame them. Okay, so back to WrestleMania 17. Shane defeats Vince while the WCW wrestlers watch from the skybox. While the initial plan of having the WCW wrestlers interfere during the McMahon vs McMahon match was scrapped, the original plan was still to have WCW as its own separate entity. Vince wanted WCW to continue on with its own roster, shows and pay-per-views. Sure, there would be opportunities down the road to have crossover matches and events, but WCW was supposed to to remain as a separate company under the WWF umbrella. News outlets speculated that TNN would begin airing WCW programming produced by the WWF, but there was no interest, and many believe that McMahon's failed XFL experiment was a key reason as to why Viacom and other networks didn't want to touch WCW, along with WCW's final reputation. So now, Vince had a ton of extra superstars, but not enough TV time to showcase their talents. This problem inadvertently caused the WWF roster to grow protective over their spot on the cards. Here was a bunch of new guys coming into the WWF, the majority of which being young, hungry and talented, and there was nowhere to showcase these guys except on WWF programming. 
This resulted in locker room animosity. There are reports out there about WCW talent getting treated like dirt by the WWF boys, and many WCW guys had to prove themselves to the World Wrestling Federation locker room. The overcrowded locker room situation was somewhat fixed by the brand extension, but we'll talk about that later. Lance Storm was the first WCW guy to make an appearance inside a WWF ring during the invasion. On the May 28th episode of Raw's War, Lance interfered during a tag team match pitting Steve Blackman and Trish Stratus against Perry Saturn and Terry Reynolds. Shane McMahon greeted Lance Storm outside the arena afterwards, saying the invasion has now officially begun, while Vince McMahon chewed out WWF staff for failing to stop Lance Storm from jumping into the ring. This was the official kickoff for the Invasion storyline. On the June 4th episode of Raw's War, Hugh Morris showed up, hitting Edge with a moonsault before running away just like Lance Storm. The Hugh Morris interference though was actually kinda cool. When Morris showed up, a huge shaking WCW logo appeared on the Titantron while music played. The audience got excited thanks to the addition of the music and the WCW graphic on the screen, and even though it was Hugh Morris, it was still a cool little moment. During the same time period, someone was stalking The Undertaker's wife Sarah, and Taker's main on-screen storyline was all about finding out the identity of the stalker. The stalker was revealed to be none other than WCW's Diamond Dallas Page. Taker completely destroyed DDP at the 2001 King of the Ring. It wasn't an official match, it was just a baiting for the sake of a baiting. Also at the King of the Ring pay-per-view, Booker T made his first ever WWF appearance when he attacked Stone Cold Steve Austin, and the very next night in Madison Square Garden, during a confrontation between Shane and Vince McMahon, Booker T showed up once again, attacking Vince McMahon before the WWF locker room hit the ring. The WWF guys noticed that the WCW attackers would always leave through the audience after their attacks, sneaking out of arenas through the back door, so when Chuck Palumbo and Sean O'Hare attacked the Hardys and the Dudley Boys on the June 28th, 2001 episode of SmackDown, Team WWF had a few guys waiting at the exits. This was the first time the WWF got the upper hand over WCW, and it certainly wouldn't be the last time. The July 2nd, 2001 episode of Raw's War would prove to be a historic broadcast of the World Wrestling Federation's flagship show. On this evening, for the very first time ever, WCW would take over the final 20 minutes of the show. It's been said that this was done to test the waters. Television networks were not very eager to give the WWF an extra TV slot to broadcast a WCW exclusive show, but that didn't mean the WWF couldn't use the TV slots they already had to present World Championship Wrestling as its own entity. Remember, the WWF still had Raw and SmackDown. An idea being thrown around was to change Raw or SmackDown to a WCW exclusive show, and while TNN and UPN may have tried to block this from happening, at least the WWF could try and show networks that WCW could be a success by using this final 20 minutes of Raw as a prime example. Why the WWF decided to put Buff Bagwell against Booker T though during this final 20 minutes of Raw is anyone's guess. The WCW branding around the arena and on the screens looked good. The WWF version of WCW WCW sure had its own identity with the new logo, the WCW exclusive commentary team, even the lighting inside the arena was changed, but people didn't like the Bagwell vs Booker match that took place on the July 2nd episode of Raw. Now, I mentioned this before and I believe it was in the Buff Bagwell video I uploaded, but I didn't and I still don't find this match half as bad as what people make it out to be. I think people like to shit on it because of what WCW had become at the time and and yes, I do agree that in comparison to the main eventers of the WWF, this definitely isn't a classic for the ages, but watch Raw in 2001 and you'll find dozens upon dozens of matches that were worse than Booker T vs Buff Bagwell. Still, the fans in attendance booed from the opening bell. Vince McMahon apparently hated the whole segment. Booker T and Buff Bagwell got beat up by Steve Austin and Kurt Angle after the match. And yeah, WCW were treated like second class citizens here. 
If this was all devised to show off what WCW was all about and test the waters for future blocks of WCW programming, whether on WWF television or through exclusive shows, then the WWF completely shot themselves in the foot here. WCW looked incredibly weak in comparison to the almighty WWF. What's even more puzzling is the fact that WWF Raw was in Atlanta the following week. Why didn't the WWF wait until they were in WCW's home turf before putting a WCW match on their TV show? It's absolutely insane. Many people forget that Booker T vs Buff Bagwell wasn't the only WCW match to happen on WWF's weekly TV shows. That same week on the July 5th episode of Smackdown, Billy Kidman faced Shane Helms and DDP squared off with Booker T. Both of these matches were presented under the WCW banner. With Smackdown being taped though, it's impossible to judge the true crowd reaction to these matches, but personally speaking, I thought they were fine, even better than the Bagwell vs Booker match from Raw. But anyway, the Invasion pay-per-view had been promoted over the past two weeks. The WWF and WCW were going to settle their differences inside the ring, and the Invasion show would turn out to be one of the WWE's most purchased pay-per-views, with the exception of the WrestleMania series. Before getting there, we need to have a look at the July 9th episode of Raw, another important night that would completely alter the course of the Invasion. WCW's Lance Storm and Mike Awesome were scheduled to take on Chris Jerry and Kane. Near the end of the match, Rob Van Dam and Tommy Dreamer made an appearance, heading the ring to attack Kane and Jericho. A bunch of WWF guys hit the ring, but it didn't take a genius to work out that these same WWF guys were all former ECW wrestlers, and these same ECW wrestlers also began beating up Jericho and Kane. Paul Heyman stood up from the commentary desk and announced that this invasion wasn't just about WCW taking over, Extreme Championship wrestling had also joined the party. It was necessary, it had to happen really. Team WCW lacked star power and with ECW joining the invasion, the WWF looked like they might actually, for a brief moment, be in some sort of jeopardy. Later in the evening, Vince and Shane tried to put their differences aside to take out Paul Heyman and ECW. Five WWF guys and five WCW guys would team up to rid this invasion of ECW. The guys on the WWF and WCW sides began fighting before ECW could even make an appearance, and after Team WWF took out Team WCW, the guys from Extreme Championship Wrestling showed up to destroy the World Wrestling Federation. The WCW guys got back in the ring, high-fiving the ECW roster as Paul Heyman and Shane McMahon hugged in the middle of the ring. ECW and WCW had joined forces. Shane said that this was all his doing, and to end this episode of Raw, it was revealed that ECW had a new owner, none other than Stephanie McMahon herself. People rolled their eyes at this and I can definitely agree that the McMahon rivalry had gotten out of hand by this point. The Shane vs Vince stuff was tolerable, but Stephanie was just so out of place as the owner of ECW it made zero sense, and she was so far away from what ECW was originally supposed to be about that many fans just shook their heads at this reveal. Still, it was now all about Shane and Stephanie versus Vince McMahon. The invasion stuff was simply their battleground. I should also mention that another main storyline heading into the invasion was centered around Steve Austin and how Vince McMahon wanted the old Stone Cold back, seeing as Austin had been getting a little emotional during the late stages of his heel relationship with Vince McMahon. The July 16th episode of Raw showed us that the old Stone Cold was indeed back and in business, so the Alliance would have to face one of the WWF's most popular superstars in the Invasion pay-per-view main event. So let's look at the Invasion pay-per-view then, a bunch of matches that forced the WWF to square off with ECW and WCW stars. I've already talked about how the WWF should have waited this one out until they had a much more 
robust WCW roster, but still, we got what we got here, and also, even with the lack of WCW star power, the Invasion pay-per-view was still very good. It felt different, and it felt quite significant. The show played out like a race to see who could score the most wins, and the main event's inaugural brawl would settle the score between the WCW ECW Alliance and the WWF. The inaugural brawl 10-man tag main event featured the WCW ECW team of Booker T, Diamond Dallas Page, Rhino and the Dudley Boys taking on Kane, Chris Jericho, The Undertaker, Kurt Angle and Stone Cold Steve Austin. The very first match of the night happened on Sunday Night Heat. Chavo Guerrero defeated Scotty Tuhati to give the Alliance the first win of the night. To kick off the Invasion pay-per-view, Edge and Christian defeated Lance Storm and Mike Awesome, so both sides scored a win each. WWF referee Earl Hebner was able to beat Nick Patrick in a comically bad but oddly entertaining match to bring the scores to 2-1. The APA would not do the job for Chuck Palumbo and Sean O'Hare, so the WWF took a two-point lead. Billy Kidman scored a point for the Alliance when he defeated Axpok. Raven got another point when he defeated William Regal. Chris Kenyon, Hugh Morris and Sean Stasiak got the win over Albert, Billy Gunn and The Big Show to bring the scores up to 4-3 in favour of the Alliance. Tajiri got a win for Team WWF when he beat Taz to even up the scores. Rob Van Dam and Jeff Hardy stole the show in their WWF Hardcore Championship match. RVD got the win here to make the scores 5-4. A bra and panties match was then presented which saw the WWF team of Trish and Lita defeat the Alliance's Stacey Keebler and Tori Wilson. So the WWF had 5 wins and the Alliance had 5 wins as we went into the main event. The inaugural brawl did have that big fight feel to it. It wasn't a bad match at all but the main problem I had with this main event is the fact that really it only felt like DDP and Booker T were true newcomers and invaders. The Dudley Boys and Rhino had been working in the WWF before the alliance became a thing and I always felt that their spots could have maybe gone to somebody else, maybe Rob Van Dam and Lance Storm, but still the match wasn't bad at all. At the end of the bout Stone Cold Steve Austin turned on the WWF when he sided with the alliance, hitting the Stone Cold Stunner on Kurt Angle and allowing Booker T to score the pinfall win. Stone Cold celebrated with Shane, Heyman and Stephanie after the match, the alliance had won the inaugural brawl and the alliance had also won more matches than the WWF. The storyline didn't end here though, not by a long shot. The WCW ECW coalition may have gotten the upper hand at the Invasion pay-per-view, but don't fool yourself, this was Vince McMahon's world, and Vince would go out of his way to prove that the WWF was superior to WCW and ECW through a series of questionable booking decisions. All of this and more will be covered in part 2 of the Invasion storyline, and that very video will get uploaded later this week. Thanks for watching.